because my purpose and passion is to help people like yourself. I invite you to get comfortable, tune out the rest of the world, and follow me to a place that may change your life and the lives of others around you. I'm Dr. Jay Sordian, and I invite you to take the natural pathway to optimal health. Your optimal wellness and vitality is something that I take very seriously, and so should you. Do you ever wake up feeling just like your energy is not quite right, or do you ever feel like your health is drifting downwards? Well, that is the reason why you might call the doctor. However, I would like to offer some alternatives to that so that your health and vitality is much more dependable, powerful, and steady. There are small things that you could change in your lifestyle that could have huge benefits. So I want you to feel really great because great is what life is all about. I began my training in 1971 when I was the surgical assistant for my uncle in Indianapolis. I began getting interested in oriental medicine when I started studying Tai Chi Chuan and Japanese language at college. The focus of this video is on you and your health. As I share my knowledge with you, I'm sure you will agree and understand more about your body and how your health works. With this knowledge, you will be able to have a greater control over how you live your life naturally. Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Dr. Jay Sorkin. I'm a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist in California. And uh, today's topic is balancing women's hormones naturally. And uh, a little about my background, uh, when I was 18 I started studying Japanese and then um, as part of my college studies I went to Japan and I lived there for three years total, so I read, write, and speak Japanese and that's where I started doing my, my first study in, in acupuncture. I was doing Tai Chi since, I was, since age 18 and also teaching it in college, but um, when I got to Japan I decided I started one, one year to start to study acupuncture. And so, um, how many of you have been to Japan? Well, this is a, um, this picture here is a picture of the Tokyo Railway and subway system. And it looks very similar to the system that's used in acupuncture. There are connections all throughout the body with different different avenues of communication with electricity, and the same thing happens in Tokyo. Tokyo, I think, I can't remember if it's 20 million now during the day, and it's um, like 8 million at night. So there's this influx every day, so there's this pulsation that goes on. The same thing happens in our bodies. And so I also, I studied with a number of the top masters in Japan, in Osaka as well. And after Japan, I traveled for a couple of years as a low-budget backpacker. And so I traveled to, uh, India is up in the right left hand corner. And uh, this, I didn't actually sleep like that. That was, that was just, uh, there's a picture off the internet. I was in Danian down here, which is which is in Afghanistan. It's the Candy Buddha that the Taliban uh, blew up. And I, I was able, I can say that I stood on Buddha's head because you could go up through the, through the cliffs there. You can see little holes in the cliff and they actually, um, dug out stairways up and took all the way up. So as I was traveling, I also went to Sri Lanka. I got a cut on my foot. I don't know if anyone has heard this story before, but I got a little cut on my foot, which is a coral cut, and um, it started getting more and more infected. So I went to various doctors. We used gingin, violet, and other types of homeopathic remedies and things. But as I was traveling, I had to kind of keep going so I didn't have a chance to really stop. And um, so eventually I got up to Kathmandu, and by then my, my leg, my foot was really swollen, it looked really bad. 
And so I went to the, the uh, Western Hospital, the ER route, and uh, waited for like four hours in line like everyone else did. Although as a foreigner, you could have walked in front of the line, but I didn't do that. So um, they gave me some antibiotics. After about five days, my foot got like, much better. And then after about eight days, it got worse, and my whole leg swelled up. And so I checked myself in the hospital and had IV antibiotics for several days. And my leg went down, but they checked me out, and, and um, there really wasn't anything else Western medicine could do. And so I went to an Ayurvedic doctor in Kathmandu, who other Europeans and people have recommended. And um, Dr. Mana said, oh, no problem. Here, eat, take these herbs, and they look like little rabbit droppings. And take these and, and uh, put this powder on your foot and wrap it with oil and keep it dry, and you'll be fine. I said, great. Okay, so what is it? He said, leprosy. Anyone here had leprosy? Raise your hand. No, I didn't care what he called it as long as he knew what to do. And it's fine, and I haven't had any problems since. So it, it made me realize the impact and the, and the strength of natural medicine when Western medicine doesn't always work in all areas. So I worked at the Franklin Institute, uh, translating Japanese research on cancer for five years before I moved out here to California. And so I moved from Pennsylvania to California on July 4th. 1983, and when I moved out here, the immune, the uh, HIV/AIDS was just beginning to rear its head. So I helped found the Immune Enhancement Project, which was a program that used herbs and acupuncture to help people with AIDS to enhance their immune system and to help balance hormones. So that's a little bit about my background. I also studied homeopathy in India, and. Uh, the little arrow though is, is the slum clinic. They called it the slum clinic in Calcutta. I didn't call it that, they did. And so let's get into women's hormones. So there are, this was in 1996. Ellen Brown stated that 40 million women, women are scheduled to go through the change in the next 20 years. And um, so now we're almost 20 years later. And so menopause is certainly a large area. There are four main areas where women can receive false information. One is the pharmaceutical industry. Major side effects of estrogen and progesterone. And replacement therapy of breast cancer, heart attack, stroke, and blood clots. And if you do look on, on the um, labels of things like Primarin, it does say that uh, long-term use is contraindicated. It's actually a seven times greater risk of endometrial cancer after using it approximately seven months. Seven months. So many women have been on it for years. Now there are other types of um, hormone replacement therapy, but Primarin has been one of the primary ones. And you know what Primarin means? Free um, it's, it's a horse hormone. Yeah, it's, it's um, it is progesterone from horses. It's pregnant mare's urine. That's what Premarin stands for. Yeah. They keep the, the uh, horses pregnant to produce the progesterone. So, um, they're all, also 40 to 80% of all hysterectomies are unnecessary. Advertising industry um, also promotes an area that can be false information. In the, there's a great deal of valuing youthfulness, and so a lot of people will chase, chase things that are not necessarily good for them. And friends and family also can give misinformation as well. So the purpose of tonight's talk, today's talk, is to provide some true facts, help you make informed decisions. So how many are here because of menopausal issues? Anyone here because of PMS? Yeah. All right, so we'll focus, more, <laughs> we'll focus more on menopause today. Uh, to understand PMS, menopause, osteoporosis, and infertility, we really need to understand the roles of stress on the organs, the issue of estrogen, progesterone, and blood sugar, and osteoporosis. One must realize that the 12 organs of the body control all bodily functions. So estrogen, everyone's heard of estrogen, right? How many kinds of estrogen are there? The, 
there are three primary forms of estrogen. There are a lot of uh, metabolites as well. And all the estrogens are based on a number. Estrone, est one, estrone, estrone is one, estradiol, two, estriol, three. This is one, two, three. Estrone, est estradiol, and estriol. Estrogen is the hormone produced by the body to prepare for pregnancy and is the dominant hormone for the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle. In your lecture notes, I hope you don't mind going through some basic hormonal physiology here. In the lecture notes, um, the first page is my biography, the second page is some common symptoms of three different areas. On the back side of that page, there is a picture of various glands in the body because all of these glands control hormones. At the bottom of the page, we've got a figure 2619, relative concentrations of anterior pituitary hormones. So this focuses on the pituitary hormone, luteinizing hormone, and FSH, and then there are also estrogen and progesterone in there as well. The next one is related to blood levels of estrogen and progesterone in pregnancy because I've done this um, presentation related to infertility. Um, this information is up there as well. So you can see on figure 2819 down the corner, the first half, this is the whole menstrual cycle here, on this side to the side. In the first half, there's a predominance of estrogen. Estrogen has to have particular peaks as um, there's follicle stimulating hormone comes in, it, it stimulates the follicles to mature, at least one of them, the mature follicle then starts producing more estrogen. Estrogen will peak causes the, a release of luteinizing hormone, which is the pituitary hormone. And then luteinizing hormone then causes a drop in estrogen and an increase in progesterone. So that's kind of how Sorry? Lutein. Lutinizing. Lutinizing. L-U-T-E-I-N. But the first two weeks is estrogen and FSH. 